Welcome everyone. My name is Erin Anderson and I'm the Director of Programs and Advancement for the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association. I'm also an AIH patient. I live in Minneapolis with my husband and our seven-year-old and our four-year-old little boys. This is our very first AIH boot camp. Um, it's designed for patients newly diagnosed um, and their families. From my personal experience, I know how scary it can be to be diagnosed with a rare disease and how little information is out there that's designed for patients. Um, I found the AIHA to be a great source of information early on in my diagnosis and the information I learned from the organization helped me to ask better questions of my doctors and to better adver advocate for myself within the healthcare system. And I hope today's workshop will do the same for you. Before I hand it over to Dr. Craig Lammer, the AIHA's Executive Director, I wanted to briefly share a little bit of information about the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association and the resources we offer to help patients and families better navigate this disease. The Autoimmune Hepatitis Association is a nonprofit. We have more than 1,600 members. Most of our members live in the US and Canada, but we also have members from across the world. We highly encourage you to join the AIHA. It's free um, if you haven't already. You can join at www.aihep.org. I'll also list the link in the chat box in just a few minutes. As an organization, we offer a number of resources for patients. Our signature program is a national conference we hold every other year. We have recordings from the educational talks from our past conferences on our YouTube channel. Right now we have a um, COVID-19 webinar series that's designed to provide information about the pandemic. It's specifically geared for autoimmune liver disease patients and families. We've held seven webinars so far, and the next one will be Monday, July 27th at 5 p.m. Eastern time on our Facebook page. Past webinars um, are available on our YouTube channel. We recently started a handful of virtual support groups for patients and families. It's just an opportunity for patients to connect more informally with one another. Um, we occasionally plan to have guest speakers to talk about topics that members um, want to learn more about. We have groups right now for the Midwest, Indiana, the New York area, and the West Coast. If you live in one of those areas and would like to attend the next meeting, feel free to send us an email. We'd love to have you join one of the gr those groups if there's one in your area. Make sure you're following us on Facebook and have joined our private Facebook group. We're also active on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Um, so really encourage you to stay in touch with us that way as well. Now I'd like to hand it over to our executive director, Dr. Lammer. Great. Thanks, Erin. Uh, good afternoon or morning, wherever you're following us from today. Um, I'm so happy that you're here. Again, I'm Craig Lammer. I'm the executive director for the AIHA. Uh, I'm also an adult hepatologist here at Indiana University. Um, it's really been my honor to, to lead this organization and be a part of the founding uh, committees as well to, to get this started about five years ago. I think this boot camp is what we named it today, but part of the reason we did this was because of really an unmet need that I've seen at least in patients in my clinic uh, over the years as they come in from outside institutions and also just when they present with, with new disease and, and how much time it takes to inform and nurture and understand decisions that are related to this disease. I think one of the most important pieces as a patient is to be well informed so you can actively participate. Um, and then hopefully that will be what we will accomplish today. One important thing with this is I, as a physician, I don't have a patient relationship with all of you, uh, or actually none of you. And so it's important to realize that this is a disclaimer from the AIHA and I cannot per, uh, Take the place of your primary care doctor, your gastroenterologist, your hepatologist. I can't diagnose or treat you. I can't manage your symptoms. But I, uh, I do believe any change in therapy or treatment or questions that come out of this webinar, it always should be going back to your primary care team. And then any changes in therapy should be under the supervision of your treating doctor or care team as well. Now that that's out of the way, as I said before, our primary aim is really to establish a working knowledge of AIH and almost level the playing field for patients that are newly diagnosed. 
we want to empower you and we want you to take a more active role because historically we've seen that patients that are more active in their care just tend to do better and feel better as well. Um, as a part of this and to support this primary, there's a few kind of initiatives that we want to do. I want to show you some of the key players. Um, this will be very granular. And again, you'll see throughout the talk today that we will broaden out to more of a clinic-based care model of AIH as we get towards the end of the, of the session today. But I do want you to know the key cells involved as well as what's going on in the liver. We're gonna to try to understand why does somebody even get this disease? Ultimately then how does AIH hurt the liver and why do hepatologists and patients alike fret so much about getting liver tests normal? We're gonna seek the goals of therapy as well. And then as a patient, what should you expect? Um, and this is often a piece that I hear is often underserved in, in, in clinics because it's just time with patients, but also sometimes experience as well. I'm gonna tell you who I think you need on your team. And again, I should also highlight a lot of this is anecdotal. And again, a lot of this is my own opinion regarding care of AIH patients that I've learned from the AIHA, but also my own patients. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to how we can overcome some of the missing knowledge we identify in this talk today. At the very end, I may give you some of my own tips of what I've seen successful patients do as well. And maybe you can decide if you wanna pick any of those for your own care. Just a very brief primer. Autoimmune hepatitis has been around for a number of years, and actually since 1950, Jan Waldenstrom, a historical immunologist, identified a condition in a group of young women where he saw some very high immunoglobulins, which are inflammatory proteins, um, as well as a certain inflammatory cell type called a plasma cell in the liver. Really, this came to fruition of, of treatment when we invented corticosteroids, and an interesting piece of information is AIH was the first liver disease ever to have effective therapy, much to many of your chagrins. If you have or are currently utilizing corticosteroids for treatment, uh, you know that can still be a challenge. But it also highlights how therapy for AIH really hasn't changed dramatically really since the 60s. We also know that AIH still can be very diagnostically and therapeutically challenging. Um, and many of you may have led the story through your diagnosis because we know this disease is rare and rare means less than 200,000 people in the US currently have it. We also think the point prevalence or the number of people that have it right now is about 60 to 80,000 at any given time in the US. The other challenges that we see is all AIH patients often look very different. So that can relate to a lot of confusion among doctors as well as patients alike. Just to speak a little bit about inflammation, I'm gonna use that word a lot, but a lot of patients don't always know what that means in terms of the, beyond just the general sense. But when I talk about inflammation, I'm talking about these guys right here. These are lymphocytes, and these can be the bad actors of AIH. And these lymphocytes, the ones that are in purple, are surrounded by blood cells. So this is a peripheral blood sample looking at white blood cells or lymphocytes. The specific lymphocyte that we're interested in AIH, among others, but most importantly, is the T cell. And it's that cell that's actually causing the inflammation and the destruction of liver cells that's driving the abnormal liver tests and potentially even some of the symptoms that you may be having. Now, I don't expect you guys to be pathologists, but many of you, if not all of you, have undergone a liver biopsy. And I want you just to take a quick look at this slide and you can say which one, right or left, is the abnormal one. And I think it doesn't take four years of, of medical school and a pathology fellowship to understand. The slide on the left is completely normal liver architecture, which I'm gonna talk just briefly about. On the right side, you see a lot of those purple cells mixed with the pink cells. Those pink cells are hepatocytes or liver cells. Those uh, purple cells are those lymphocytes I showed you on the prior screen. So, to understand, again, this is maybe more granular that many of you would like to know, but understanding the normal architecture of the liver can be helpful for our pathologists who look at these slides to understand how we diagnose AIH. And what you can see is this area right here, which also almost looks like a triangle. We call that the portal triad. And what do we ultimately see in these other plates of liver cells, the blood drains from the portal vein to the central vein. When we see inflammation with AIH, you can see no longer do we have that nice looking triangle, but we have a lot of inflammation with those lymphocytes around that triangle, but also bleeding outside the triangle. And you may say, where is the triangle? It's probably right here, but it's very disrupted. So on a cellular level, under the microscope, this is what AIH often looks like in many patients. 
the goal of this is to calm the inflammation. I think many of you know that and you've embarked upon this journey. We're going to talk a lot more about this. But ultimately, I think a good rule of thumb is to say that immunosuppression for the treatment of AIH is generally thought to be lifelong. And our goal, which we'll define even further, is to minimize or eradicate liver destruction or injury that's being driven by these inflammatory cells. And by doing so, we want to prevent the development of scarring, which we will talk a little bit more in one moment. This slide is what I like to think of when I think about your expectation as a patient. And no, I'm not calling you a snowflake. It's the idea that you all are individuals and you all are very different. We have uh, tried very hard as a medical community to prognosticate, to bend people into groups that are gonna do well or patients that don't do well. The bottom line is AIH is very much of a spectrum. And so when you're on our chat communities and you're interacting with other patients or, or even other patients of other chronic diseases, your symptoms are gonna be individual to you and what's going on in your body. That doesn't mean we necessarily understand this, but ultimately sometimes it's a little bit easier to understand too, that maybe why your fatigue is so much worse than the person on Facebook that says they're doing great and feeling wonderful. We know the diagnosis of AIH can be a real challenge and there's a lot of things that go into that formula, but a lot of it rests on that heterogeneity, that snowflake effect. No two snowflakes are the same. And we also know patients as they present, they present very differently too. And just briefly to understand this, about two thirds of patients have a very insidious or slow onset of symptoms with really just some mild uh, symptoms, whether it's fatigue, nausea, abdominal pain. I've even had fevers, chills, lethargy, or even sleep disturbances. The other third of patients usually present very acutely with a lot of symptoms. But again, that tricks up a lot of ER doctors, but also hepatologists for that matter when we first meet you. We also know when patients present, about up to half of adult patients can have advanced scarring. And I'll use this word many times today, but we'll talk a little bit more about it, cirrhosis. Uh, we also see kids tend to have a little bit more advanced fibrosis when they present as well. And some of these things, and, and we've hypothesized that maybe genetic determinants may drive scarring, but also it could be that this diagnosis was very delayed in many patients. And I'll be honest with you, my clinic, we often look back in time and see abnormal liver tests for years leading up to diagnosis. This acute onset I noted earlier does exist and it's about a quarter of patients. And again, it may just be the acute or quick onset of AIH going from normal six weeks ago to jaundiced with really markedly abnormal liver tests within six weeks. But we also think maybe a proportion of these are patients that have had that chronic injury, smoldering inflammation, and then for whatever reason, there is a very quick uptick in inflammation. Again, we don't always understand that as well. I think the understanding between type 1 and type 2 AIH uh, should just be left as is. And it doesn't necessarily always, it's not always important for an adult hepatologist, but just because many questions come up of this as patients, a majority of cases, particularly adult onset, are type 1 autoimmune hepatitis. And really, I'm going to divide these groups so you can understand this, but it's a lot of it's based on these autoantibodies. And don't get too worried about this word soup. It's not critically important, but the very prototypical autoantibodies we see in type 1 AIH are the ones you've probably heard of. Uh, the anti-neutrophil antibody, or ANA, or the anti-smooth muscle antibody, also known as asthma. And we see these positive in about 80% of patients with the classic type 1 AIH. Type 2, on the other hand, we see a reduction in that. And actually more prone for type 2, we see anti-liver kidney microsomal antibodies. But again, type 2, the most important thing is that tends to be a disease more of the young onset of AIH. However, I do have a few patients that have LKM positivity, but that doesn't mean I always understand it either. We know the age of onset, as I've alluded to. Uh, can be a little bit different. It does tend to be more type 1 later in life, but there are patients that present at young age that still can have type 1, but again, type 2 is almost uniformly young onset. Gender-wise, I think it's notable to say that this is a female prominent disease. I'm very excited to have a male joining us today um, because we know 10 to 15 percent of AIH patients can be males, and often uh, this is unrecognized and can really distract clinicians when they're trying to diagnose AIH thinking AIH is female only. We also will talk about this other inflammatory marker, immunoglobulin G. This is a protein made by those lymphocytes or also B cells of the immune system. 
that typically ramp up production when they are overly excited, meaning being driven by some autoimmune process. But we see elevated IgG in patients with type 1 often, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the slides to come. In the presentation, as I've already highlighted, this idea of advanced scarring is variable in adults, but maybe 40 to 50 percent. And in type 2, again, it tends to be a little bit harder to treat, but more advanced. And I would probably be hesitant, but I guess if most of our members join us, is probably all type 1. The simplified criteria, this is a very busy slide, but this is what clinicians have been using at least for the past 10 to 15 years to help substantiate a diagnosis of AIH. I'll be honest with you, I almost never look at this, um, but what it's based on are the autoantibody profiles that we just briefly discussed, including the anti-neutrophil antibody, smooth muscle, liver, kidney. One that we didn't talk about, the soluble liver antigen, is something that kind of completely separate, can, but can denote a little bit more of an aggressive disease. And then the other things, the IgG we talked about, histology or the findings on the liver biopsy. And the very last one is the absence of viral hepatitis, meaning that we've excluded that as a contributing factor. One more slide that I'm going to pause. Diagnosis of AIH, again, if you want to take it in its most simplistic terms, requires a liver biopsy that is suggestive at least of AIH. But also things that support that diagnosis often include the elevation of AST and ALT, which these are liver enzymes, which again, we will talk a little bit about uh, momentarily, that increase IgG or autoimmune markers, but also the exclusion of other liver diseases. Another question I get often is, what in the world caused this? Why me? And I think the very simplistic term is it's all about tolerance. Now we have our own idea about tolerance, particularly with our kids or family or, or coworkers, but it's tolerance in regards to your immune system. And I think if you understand your immune system, particularly these lymphocytes, their job is to survey the body throughout the liver, the blood, every organ, and understand what is foreign and potentially bacteria, fungus, viral, and destroy it without recognizing your own cells that are self. And we think that this is probably the one issue with AIH that we have yet really put our finger on. We don't think it's one single thing, but just to kind of take you through a schematic of things that we think probably contribute, we definitely believe that there are some certain genetic okay. contributions that put you at risk. And we know there is specifically in an immune protein called the HLA complex. This is really important in all autoimmune diseases, so it's not surprising AIH has a very similar perspective. But there's probably many other genes, both immune and non-immune related, but also changes to the DNA, particularly how changes can happen even from the environment that we're still learning more about. There's also conditions called drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis, and then there's also viral triggers to AIH. And the working idea here is that these contributions to liver inflammation, so it can be drug-related where it causes liver injury and activation of the immune system, or let's say viral. So we've seen everything from Epstein-Barr or mono to hepatitis A, B, and C, uh, to CMV or even herpes virus, trigger autoimmune hepatitis. We also think that there may be something about gender, as we know 90% of patients are AIH, but also the age, as our immune system changes as we get older, it actually becomes a little bit less reactive. It gets, uh, gains a lot of wisdom in its older age, but that also may change how it reacts to these autoimmune stimuli as well. One of the areas that we research here at IU is about environment along with genetic pieces as well. And I put these on here just food for thought. Uh, we really haven't done any good studies to understand how smoking increases or decreases risk. Uh, coffee, we, we have a paper under review that we actually think coffee has been somewhat protective. And this actually has been seen in some other autoimmune diseases as well. It may actually impact in terms of the level of scarring that can come from inflammation. There's a lot of interest in microbiome and that's the bacteria that live in your gut. That gut bacteria has the possibility of shaping and molding the immune system as well over time. And then the really million dollar question, which we also will talk about, is diet and how diet is a predisposing factor and how all these factors create that risk profile for you to be in develop uh, AIH. Very lastly, mm -hmm. stress. Um, this is a common question and there's actually some literature behind this that in fact, if you look at the six months prior to diagnosis of AIH, many people can denote a significant stressful event in their life. I often flip it on its head and say that my life is often stressful. So what is the threshold? 
but there is some good data that meditation and mindfulness um, has been important in changing inflammatory profiles of patients. And this is data coming out of Yale in the past couple of years. So I think that's an important part of this disease. It also may be an important part of how we actually treat it in the future too. So let's talk a little bit more about this inflammation and how the inflammation, again, the lymphocytes or inflammatory cells hurt the liver cells. So this cartoon are liver cells here in orange uh, with our inflammatory cells that are permeating into those liver cells um, driven by some stimuli. One of those uh, causes I showed you on the last slide. And what can happen is these cells start to recognize these cells and for some reason identify those liver cells as not self and in fact foreign. These cells then activate and as you can see from this cartoon, it's a little busy, but they start to degrade and, and, and release a number of pieces that drive this inflammation and destruction of the liver cells that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of more destruction and more inflammation until we can pump the brakes with some form of immunosuppression. The other way AIH hurts the liver is because that inflammation drives this idea of fibrosis. And we often use fibrosis or advanced fibrosis, which is synonymous, uh, synonymous with cirrhosis. But on the left side of the slide, this tan piece, this is a liver biopsy. And this is probably stage one fibrosis. And what you're looking at here, besides liver cells in a core biopsy, around those portal tracts I showed you earlier, there's a little bit of purple. And what we're staining here are pieces of the, uh, the building blocks of scar tissue, also known as collagen. And as you progress from left to right, you see more and more of that scar tissue start to branch out of those portal tracts where they actually start to connect with other portal tracts. And honestly, this is the piece that I care the most about with AIH that I prevent the development of scarring over time. Again, the way that we do that with immunosuppression to shut down an inflammatory reaction. Um, and again, hopefully the idea that we can reverse this in some patients as well. So again, the goals of therapy, as I've just said, and to summarize the top, if you remember that destroyed uh, piece that we showed with a significant autoimmune hepatitis along with the cartoon, we want to, with therapy, return back to the normal native state of what a normal liver looks like, as well as what normal liver cells look like as well. And then ultimately, and to flip that around, patients with more advanced fibrosis or any fibrosis, we want to regress fibrosis or at least stabilize fibrosis if patients already have early stage. Other goals of therapy, uh, we have to depend heavily on the blood tests that you patients get um, in between visits and in follow-up. And I think it's important to know this idea of, and we throw this word around a lot, full biochemical remission, fancy for are their liver tests normal or not? And again, we know this response to therapy, normalizing your liver tests, this AST and ALT, as well as the immunoglobulin G is the single most important predictor of patients living without needing liver transplant. Now that does not mean if you don't have normal liver tests that you definitely will need a liver transplant, but it is a reasonable surrogate in some models that we've done. But I wanna take this moment just to discuss this idea of ALT and AST. These enzymes are contained in a lot of different tissue of the body. However, they're tremendously high in the liver cells. These are enzymes that actually help you to uh, metabolize uh, compounds and produce energy uh, with some of the sugar cycle. With destruction of liver cells, you can think those inside those cells, once they are burst open, ALT permeates the, the liver, it seeps out into the blood, where the phlebotomist then when collects your blood, your liver tests are higher than what they were before or what is a normal range. With therapy, our goal is to restore that normal liver tissue, prevent that inflammation, prevent the destruction of liver cells, and therefore your liver tests should drop. This also then includes IgG, which is more of a function of the, the inflammatory cells that are in the liver, pumping out these autoantibodies to drive more inflammation. So again, the point being that we want both of these to be normal. Again, this is often uh, a very important part of once we diagnose and encompass this idea that someone has AIH, it's always now what? Um, and unfortunately, now what often involves medication, which are a true pain in the butt for patients and doctors alike. 
and everyone's favorite steroids. Um, and many of you may have seen one of these two. Uh, prednisone is commonly the form of uh, corticosteroid we use in the US, but also budesonide is a very important drug that we've started to use more often in the past four or five years because of its less side effects throughout the rest of the body. We often, when we see this abnormal liver test and we diagnose someone with AIH, we want to whip inflammation into shape quickly. So we usually use these medications right off the bat. But the idea is that this medication is a bridge. Uh, Long-term use of corticosteroids, specifically prednisone, is fraught with a lot of side effects, symptoms, weight gain, poor sleep. And you guys may, I'm looking at the screen, I don't see a lot of nods, but I'm assuming on the inside. But once we are able to control the inflammation with a reasonable degree, we actually then start to think about the chronic immunosuppressants, which have their own problems as well, but are often better tolerated for long-term immunosuppressive care. Then with the idea that we then lower the steroids over time with the continuation of these chronic immunosuppressive categories. And I don't want you to get too worried or caught up about all these different ones. And again, many of you probably recognize some of these drug names. Um, but probably the most important, if you are newly diagnosed in the past six months or a year, the ones you probably have commonly seen the most is azathioprine, also known as Imuran, or its sister drug, 6MP or 6 mercaptopurine. Another first-line agent that we often use um, in special populations is Cellcept or mycophenolate mofetil. However, just a quick word, patients that are uh, female of child-rearing age should not utilize this compound if at all possible. Um, unless they're taking at least two forms of birth control because we know it is teratogenic or it can cause birth defects. Other agents that we use beyond these first line, which we, this is a little bit outside the scope of our boot camp today, are these other agents called calcineurin inhibitors, which include Prograf, also known as tacrolimus, cyclosporin, and then something which is a newer kid on the block called mTOR inhibitors, sirolimus or everolimus. Um, but again, that may be a follow-up uh, follow uh, webinar that we do in the future as well. Steroids, as I've said, quick acting. We actually, when patients are really, really sick, we can give them IV. There's really never been good data to show that oral and IV is better, but I'll tell you as a, as a practicing hepatologist in the hospital, IV steroids do a great job at turning inflammation down quickly. The varying dose that you can use gives you some degree of escalation decreasing. They come in very small increments, so that's really nice. But also then the side effects can be a real problem. Chronic immunosuppression too, these, uh, much as we are using steroids to abridge to these, these are slower to act. We can also tweak these and we can adjust them based on dose and they have different follow-up variables that we can see to make sure that you are at the right level. But again, these drugs also have their own side effects um, and none of these are innocuous. They, they have the capability of causing a lot of problems. So in fact, they often require fairly diligent clinical monitoring, at least in the first three months, but even beyond into the first year. As expectations for AIH, I, I think this is what I tell all my patients. You are to expect the best. Um, and and as, as a physician, this is very much a service-based industry. However, many of our AIH patients are often very healthy. This may be one of the first and newest chronic illnesses that they've ever seen or been involved with. And so I think if you maintain that mindset, I don't think you can go wrong, but that means expect the best from everything AIH related. And I think it's reassuring to understand, despite all the anxiety and worry, particularly after being sick near your time of diagnosis, but knowing most patients, are, we're able to find medication regimens that they tolerate. Most patients respond really nicely to medication and we can find a level that is tolerable, but also does the job. Most patients, again, I'm using the word most, don't need liver transplant. And I think, you know, knowing that 80 to 90% of patients will never need to go to transplant, should be very refreshing to patients. However, um, it's also better to know that patients that respond nicely, they live as long as patients that don't have AIH. So again, that's often my, my middle age to younger patients is how long do I have? And I have to redirect that question is, this is a chronic illness, but often managed well, you should be successful, you should survive, you should do excellently. Other expectations, which again, beyond that first clinic visit of starting therapy, is this idea of extrahepatic or outside the liver type of symptoms. This is actually quite prevalent. 
And this is where hepatologists often fail. Um, we know patients with AIH, in upwards of 40 to 60% of patients with AIH will have or be diagnosed with another autoimmune illness. As I told you, these genes that we have that predispose you to AIH probably set the stage for other autoimmune diseases as well. Some of the most common ones we see are rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, which includes dry mouth and dry eyes, um, but also autoimmune thyroid disorders. Celiac disease is also a, a, another common one in about three to 5% of patients with AIH as well. Fatigue, and this is the Achilles heel of many patients. But again, as I've said, the snowflake effect, we have patients that, I have patients that have no fatigue. They, they op, op, operate at 100%. I have patients on the other end of the spectrum that find it very hard to get out of bed most days of the week. Poor sleep, and this sleep disruption, we don't understand it. And again, it may be a, a side effect of some of the medications. However, uniformly, this has been problematic for just staying asleep, but also going to sleep as well. Um, itching, we see in about 20 to 30% of patients. It's not that it's always uniform or persistent, but it's not uncommon to hear patients have bouts of itching. They tend to be also worse more in the evening and overnight hours. We see a tremendous amount between about 30 to 40% of patients with some significant or clinically significant anxiety and depression. And I bring up these pieces because anxiety and depression have been really closely tied to the fatigue angle. So again, it's something that as hepatologists, if we're not trained, nor are we asking about it, we probably have to depend on our primary care doctors to be looking at this, or we just inform our patients to be mindful themselves and report these symptoms. Um, the question earlier talked about joint pain. We often see joint pain beyond improvement of liver tests as well, and it's not that we understand joint pain, but it is fairly prevalent in about 20 to 30% of patients, typically the small joints, they tend to be symmetric as well, um, and actually get a little bit worse with use. But again, it's variable among patients. I hear common complaints about hair changes, um, of losing hair, uh, seeing clumps come out in the shower. Also, we see bone changes. Um, this is not terribly evidence-based, but we do tend to see a little bit more aggressive bone loss in patients with AIH, which again, could have some role in, in the way that we treat them in terms of steroids, but also inherently in other autoimmune diseases, Bone loss or aggressive bone loss has also been a calling card of those diseases as well. But at the very end of the day, quality of life, and this is, if your hepatologist hasn't brought this up with you, I think it's something that you keep in your back pocket, is how do we optimize my quality of life? And often it's not related to those liver tests. It's not related to that biopsy. It's often related to this list of things I just gave you, and maybe others as well. So again, as a as an empowered patient, I wanna keep that as a frame of reference for you as you navigate your clinical care. This is always my favorite kind of as expect expectations. You should expect patients or, or people to assume they know what's best for you or they assume they know what's going on. Um, unfortunately though, this is riddled with ignorance, misinformation and typically very strong opinions. And this actually is very rampant also on social media as well. And uh, I don't know if you look at this list, I, I wrote these out. These are the last four comments I could remember. Patients of mine said, I didn't know you had a drinking problem or you don't look sick. Uh, I've heard husbands say to his wife, why are you so lazy? I've seen destruction of relationships because of this phenomenon, this lack of understanding. Um, I also have had patients that say, well, someone knows better than you as a treating doctor. Um, my cousin's friend roommate had this disease or had a disease like this and recommends X, Y, or Z. So again, just be careful of the assumptions and the commentary that's provided outside the clinic. You can expect to get blood work often. Again, many of you have probably already realized this as you've embarked upon your journey, primarily for monitoring of your labs, but also the side effect profile of the drugs that we're giving you as well. You also can expect, again, I love this word, extrapatic disinterest. Fancy word for your liver doctor, GI doctor, may not talk to you much about those symptoms outside the liver. I think the, the very, uh, the confident hepatologist often pats themselves on the back when I can get your liver test normal. I feel like I rule your disease. However, if I haven't taken another step further to listen to you about your symptoms, I think I'm doing a great disservice because a number of those symptoms are addressable by looking at other contributions to them as well. And again, the frame of reference, remember, is how can we improve quality of life? And then finally, your expectation as a patient is that you should be on a regimen of, of medication 
for treatment of AIH that can control your disease with minimal, but really hopefully no side effects. It's a lofty goal, but again, I think we should try to maintain that expectation as patients, but also as doctors as well. So who do I think you need on your team? Again, these are fairly brief slides and it's not surprising, but it's often patients that don't think like this as well. I think you need an awesome hepatologist, gastroenterologist. And what I mean by awesome, someone that's willing to listen to you, someone that's willing to work with you, someone that has some time to work with you. Um, but I think along with that team, uh, you need some other doctors. And I think an excellent primary care doctor that's not afraid of you, afraid of your disease, or afraid to reach out to your treating doctor for AIH, the hepatologist. I love when primary care doctors reach out to me and they wanna learn more and know more about their patients. I send a lot of patients to rheumatology because of joint pains um, and other complaints. Uh, because I'm asking a lot about fatigue, depression, anxiety, we use GI psychiatry here at IU often. Because of other autoimmune conditions, we, we, uh, particularly type one diabetes, plus things like thyroid disorders, we send a lot to endocrinology. Pulmonary is, is one of those things that sometimes becomes uh, involved, um, but, but not necessarily related to autoimmune things. Um, but when I'm worried about side effects or other uh, relation to medication. And finally, gastroenterology, because we do see about 5 to 10 percent of patients have concurrent inflammatory bowel disease. But also we see a lot of patients with just general uh, GI complaints as well, everything from loose stools to constipation. Um, who do you need on your team at home? Again, not surprising your spouse, family, friends, and maybe others, but I, I, I highlight the word educated. I plead with you to bring someone with you to visit uh, with, your, with your hepatologist or gastroenterologist. You need these patients that get it, or these people that get it, these people that won't judge you based on this disease, that will support you. And there's a lot of interest in this idea of caregivers. It's not a favorite term of mine, but it's those patients or those individuals that are in your corner that are willing to be there when you're having a bad day. Um, you know, as, as a non-for-profit, we've, we've tried to be that for some folks, um, and that's where we use our, our membership pool, our newsletters, our webinars, but also in our Facebook groups as well and how we interact with patients. But also, I will encourage you to seek out other patients with AIH because they've been there, they've done that often. Uh, the very final slide, which includes a lot, um, this is kind of from my own clinic and what everybody asks about is diet. And I, I usually make this face. I, I don't know the answer to this, but I will say patients, uh, one thing is we do need to study this. Diet is incredibly hard to study. The other thing is humans, particularly North American humans, we're often not good about maintaining good diet control. If we make changes, we usually kind of regress back to the mean, which is often many of us, not always excellent eating. But I've had patients that say eating clean or eating diets high in fruits and vegetables, uh, nutritional diets, uh, things that are uh, whole wheat, uh, trying to avoid foods, uh, sugars, particularly those that are rapidly absorbable. So those complex carbohydrate predilection, patients seem to feel better. One thing I will say, the, very, the rule is, uh, if you'd like to try it, I think you should try it. And I think you should always try to experiment with diet. But also it's probably important to take notes to say, if you have an ongoing dietary history of a book and track what you eat, I think if you feel good, you can then go back to your notes. So I think that's a really nice tip. But again, it's often hard to be careful and, and document everything you eat. At least it would be for me. Exercise, I encourage as much exercise as patients will handle. For the fear though that you know intensifying fatigue, I just don't see a lot of it. Um, and I think honestly, there may be a hump with fatigue and pushing through and then generating some kind of uh, endurance particularly with cardiovascular training, but even weight training, maintaining muscle mass, not building muscle, but just maintenance has been very beneficial for a number of my patients that have been willing to put in the time and effort. And it was very hard for them, but ultimately at the end of the day, they felt better. And I think along with that too, is just maintaining a normal healthy weight that's age appropriate and also based on your frame as well as your height. I've seen patients that maintain those BMIs of normalcy also generally feel better than those patients that are overweight or in fact on the other side, underweight as well. Supplements come up often and I think this is just human nature. Uh, Craig Lammer, what can I do to take that you're not providing with me in the clinic? Be honest with you, if, if I knew something was very beneficial, that would be a part of our clinic visit. Again, human nature is to, to seek out therapies, to seek how to improve and whether that's within the realm of normal medical 
knowledge or in the supplement or complementary alternative, uh, complementary alternative medical strategies, patients are drawn to this. And I will say that universally as a good rule of thumb, you don't need them. Um, that doesn't mean I don't understand them, and it doesn't mean that some of them may not be beneficial. The problem is without regulation of supplements, we don't know what's in those compounds. And theoretically, that can also cause damage to the liver. And you have to remember, I'm speaking as a hepatologist. Every year, I see a handful of severe drug-induced liver injury related to supplements that have caused liver failure or need for liver transplant. So I would approach them with very uh, significant caution. Supplements, though, that may be reasonable include vitamin D. Um, we've talked recently about how vitamin D may be even beneficial for COVID-19, but also vitamin D deficiency has been an important predictor of worse outcomes with AIH patients. So particularly if you're a female and over the age of 60, calcium and vitamin D supplement with the authorization of your primary care doctor may be a completely reasonable approach. Sleep, you should protect your sleep at all costs. Um, again, as one is a management of fatigue, I'm always surprised the number of patients that come and tell me how tired they are, but then I ask them when they went to bed and when they woke up, and it's almost universally less than seven hours. It's also often disjointed. They often has a husband or a wife that snores. They often snore, um, or they have urinary issues where they're getting up multiple times a, a night. So that kind of dysregulated sleep is one of the really key things I hone into when people start talking about fatigue, but no one likes to talk about it. Um, so I have uh, diagnosed a number of patients with obstructive sleep apnea, and once we fix that and treat that, much of the fatigue improves. So we should always be seeking secondary causes outside of AIH for these other symptoms that we've talked about. Excellent communications. This is with not only your family, but also your doctors. Um, and my expectation, I, I tell all of my patients that this is a team. You should expect quick communication from my office to them, but I should expect reasonably quick re uh, conversation back when they're having symptoms. Don't ever put me behind the eight ball. Don't call me and say, I've been having really severe symptoms for two weeks. That can be a real challenge for me. So open communication with your doctor's office, but also your family, I think can be very helpful as the kind of support you get from the clinic, but also at home. Again, going back to the term I said before, expect the best. And again, maintaining that along with your family, caregivers, but also your doctor's offices as well. And I ask you, uh, I try to be an all-star doctor, if you will. I expect my patients to be all-star patients. And that doesn't mean knowing everything about this disease, but I get excited when patients are interested. I'm very quick to in engage patients and work with them to try to understand. But also being a prepared patient, I think just, again, gives you a little bit more of a stake in this disease by bringing your questions, being prepared, taking notes, um, often we, we tell patients that you'll remember about 10% of what I tell you in the office, and that's very true. Um, but that's why bringing another set of ears is probably important, but also writing things down as you go. Coming early, um, despite I know us doctors, we, we tend to lag behind and we drag. Um, I really respect that. I respect people that respect my time. Um, I think coming in with that list of questions with those key points will make sure that your, your visits are fruitful. Um, and above all, this sounds really silly, but being nice often gets you a lot more attention. Um, again, that's just the way that, that medical care and also any business model looks like too. So being nice can go a long way um, in getting you cared for, um, but also being understanding. At the end of the day though, breaking up with care providers can be hard, uh, much like any relationship. I think taking a very good inward look that maybe this relationship with this doctor, this nurse, is not the right one. And in fact, who is going to be your partner in healthcare to kind of get you to where you are, whether they're willing to listen or get your symptoms controlled um, or respectful of your time. You know, I don't want you coming to the doctor's office to be an annoyance or a pain and uh, be fraught with issues. And, and uh, that's probably one of the worst feedbacks I get from my patients is, you know, my office was slow to get them in a room or um, I didn't have enough time with them. So I think uh, with this, you know, you're allowed to be choosy with doctors. Now, there are things in healthcare systems like at IU that if you want to change in care, it's a, it's a process. But again, I think it's part of that advocation for yourself um, for the best care possible. And then at the end, uh, participation in your care, but also among others throughout your journey, you are learning a tremendous amount of information. And I always encourage my patients to share it. 
There's, there's nothing more beautiful to me like today. You guys are seeing the faces of AIH patients that you may have never seen before. You may have never met anybody with AIH, and that's a really powerful thing. So as I've highlighted along the way that we have a lot of missing knowledge and there's a lot of research questions. And one thing we do here at IU is I am funded by the National Institute of Health to study AIH. And so we've provided a way for you to, to, to participate in research from the, the coziness of your couch. And one thing that I think as patients you understand it's as we've talked about a rare disease, if you go to an academic medical center, or a doctor's office for that matter, it seems like you should be able to be plugged into research very easily. Unfortunately, you've probably learned that that's not the case. So we wanna make it easy. My research is to really understand why this disease happens. We wanna identify those patients that are at higher risk of bad outcomes. But we also, at the end of the day, if we can disentangle why people are so, why people are so different, maybe we can identify specialized therapies and more target therapies than kind of carpet bombing uh, the immune system with, with corticosteroids or azathioprine. And if you would ever be so inclined or interested, I want to introduce Kelsey Green. She's my research coordinator through what we call the GRACE study. GRACE is directed at AIH study, as I've highlighted. And her email is here, Kelsey Green. And all it takes is a very simple email to her that you're interested. Everything can be done from home, but it would be a really great step to helping us further the knowledge for AIH, but also active participation with our organization at the AIHA, uh, we want to bring you into the fold. We want you active on the patient side of things, the clinical side of things, but also research as well. 